we should be live on Facebook now, but we did have a little problem at the beginning. So I'm really sorry, Andy, but I'm just going to quickly just reintroduce you. For anyone who is watching on Facebook, you will have missed the beginning. But Andy is talking about um, SPF and how to recommend different SPFs for your client. Um, Andy Millwood, if you don't know him, is an amazing facialist and esthetician. Um, and apologies if you missed the very beginning. We were just talking a little bit just to recap about mineral and chemical sunscreens and really that there's perhaps not as much of a difference as people would think. Um, so Andy, I'm sorry to, to make you go for it again. Would you mind just kind of recapping, like, what, why do you think that um, there is that misconception that, that people think that these are very sort of different formulas and whereas perhaps actually there's not a huge amount of uh, difference for clients? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't know where the myth originally came from, uh, whether it was just a miscommunication or whether it was just a misunderstanding or, uh, you know, as things within science often do, that our, our knowledge and understanding develops over time. Um, but certainly I've known this, as I said, through following uh, uh, it's actually Michelle at Lab Muff in Beauty Science, like if, if anyone wants to go and follow her, she's an amazing uh, chemist and, and really spends a lot of time with uh, myth busting um, and it was through her that I learned this about three possibly even four years ago um, that the fact that the, the way that mineral filters and chemical filters so uh, uh, inorganic and organic filters actually work is pretty much the same in the fact that they are all absorbing UV energy and then kind of um, divert it or convert it into heat or something less harmful than UV and actually mineral filters like zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, for example, only actually uh, reflect or scatter around 10% of UV, the rest is absorbed. So once we understand that they, you know, they are functioning in the same way, as, as I said, it kind of changes our perception as to the way, the way that we would use them um, and which may be suitable in certain scenarios. Definitely. So with that in mind then, what would be um, your basis for kind of choosing and recommending a certain type of SPF to a client? Um, for example, would this vary by skin colour? Would you, would you recommend different ingredients or different sort of filters for depending on skin colour? Absolutely. So one of the things with mineral filters in particular and also uh, one of the, the, the organic uh, filters um, is that some filters leave a white cast. So zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and an ingredient called Tinosorb M. Um, these are, um, so Tinosorb M is, is technically a chemical filter uh, or, or an organic filter, but it can reflect 10% of UV in the same way as what zinc oxide would. Um, but they leave, they leave a bit of a white cast. So they're not necessarily the best or most aesthetically pleasing um, kind of filter to be using on darker skin tones. So for, you know, darker skin tones, Fitzpatrick, maybe five and six, may be better off suitable for more of the organic or chemical filters uh, because it's not going to leave a white cast. Excellent, thank you. And what about um, any thoughts around different skin types, I suppose oily skins or, or drier skins? Would there, again, would there be different types of SPF or, or ingredient you'd recommend depending on skin type? Yeah, so from a UV filter, um, it's not as important um, as such more of the base formula. So it's exactly the same as if we were picking a moisturiser for, you know, an oily, com uh, oily skin, dry skin, etc. Um, so we've really got to take into consideration the base formula. And some, screen, some sunscreens are a lot lighter than others. They might use uh, solvents like alcohol, for example, to thin them out, makes them more... Uh, suitable for like an oilier skin. However, on the up opposite side of that, if they thinned it out too much, or, or the alcohol is one of the first, is the first or second ingredient, it may actually be a little bit too drying for the skin. So we've kind of got to take into consideration uh, the whole formulation. And as we always say within the within the industry, formulation is king. So it's not just about what filters they have and how those filters work, but actually looking at the, the whole formulation as well. So looking at texture, looking at whether um, there's a white cast or not. Um, if there's fragrance in there, you know, more sensitive skins may not necessarily uh, kind of appreciate that very, uh, very much. Um, so I, one of the things I always say to my clients is there's no hard or fast rules about finding the best sunscreen 
it's all about there is a little element to trial and error. Whereas with the rest of the regime, you know, cleansers, your serums, your moisturizers, etc., it's very much targeted towards their specific skin concern. But when it comes to sunscreen, it's, you know, it's kind of try a different, you know, try a few, see what works well for your skin um, and kind of, yeah, trial and error. Yeah, excellent. So I suppose having those conversations with your client and asking them for feedback and making yeah. it part of a consultation process. There are a few um, like chemical, uh, like organic filters that are, that tend to be a little bit more irritating than others. So if I had somebody who was a little bit more on the sensitive side, their skin maybe was a little bit more compromised, or they had uh, like an acne prone skin, I'd be kind of wary about certain filters that may, you know, irritate that follicle and make that acne worse, for example. Um, they tend to be more of the older, uh, more traditional filters that um, things like uh, oxybenzone, for example, um, uh, octin uh, octinazone, uh, octinazate, um, octisalate, those kind of traditional filters. Um, there are plenty of others as well. I've always got really hard to pronounce chemical names, but some of the newer filters that are considered a lot less irritating would be things like Tinazorb S, Tinazorb M, um, Univol. Uh, a plus, for example, um, as well as your mineral filters. So mineral filters like zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, they're also considered, um, you know, less irritating. So tend to suit more uh, sensitive skin is better. Excellent, thank you. And um, just before we carry on, if anyone has any questions about Andy as we go along, do type them uh, here in. If you're watching in Zoom, in the comments or in the little Q and A box at the bottom of your screen, um, and if you're watching on Facebook, just type them in the comments under the video. Because um, yeah, we'll definitely get to questions as well. And um, but yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, Andy. What about? Um, I suppose for a lot of people, their concern is pigmentation when it comes to SPF as well, um, yeah. and particularly with particular skin issues such as melasma. Are there any um, ingredients that therapists should look out to recommend for people whose concern really is pigmentation as, as well as the other issues that you get with UV? Um, again, not really, but a lot of this goes back to the myth between mineral filters working differently to chemical filters. So the idea, because people believe that mineral filters, as I said, reflected UV and therefore there was less heat generated within the skin, um, the recommendation, for, particularly for things like melasma, the recommendation was always to stick with mineral filters because there was a worry or a concern that a heat, uh, any heat that is absorbed into the skin could potentially make that melasma worse. But it's all based on theory around how those ingredients work. There's actually no evidence to support that one filter would be better than another for treating something like uh, melasma. And as, as I said, now we understand that you, uh, mineral filters in particular um, still absorb UV in the same way as chemical filters, it kind of make, makes the whole argument for using mineral for pigmentation and melasma um, kind of redundant, really. It doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so not really. I think that if somebody has uh, melasma or uh, is concerned with treating pigmentation, then always just go for the higher, um, higher SPFs, the better. And also really important that we look at broad spectrum as well. So as I mentioned, there's lots of different UV, um, like uh, chemical UV filters, but some of them may only protect against UVB, some of them may only protect against UVA, and then within UVA, we've also got UVA1 and UVA2, it's quite a broad, broad spectrum of light. So from a chemical filter perspective, you really want to be looking at uh, either Tinazorb s &M because they're classed as broad spectrum, or a product that's got a combination of different filters. So you, you know, UVB filters, UVA filters. Um, and again, from a formulation perspective, some filters are a little less stable than others. So that's why they might add another um, filter to make it more photostable so it doesn't break down in the, in the sun. Um, so yeah, ideally look for um, something that's broad spectrum, but really, and then finding one that really works with your skin tone uh, uh, as well and skin type because uh, as I said it doesn't necessarily it's not as necessarily important whether it's mineral or, fil um, or or chemical or even a combination so I tend to use a lot of hybrids where they're actually a combination of both uh, organic and inorganic filters. Okay interesting so I suppose if um are there any kind of key 
filters or ingredients to look out for as a, a definite need to have and any to kind of avoid in, in SPFs, I suppose. Or, again, is it going to vary depending on your client or are there any sort of things that you would say, that's what you want to look for, that's an essential? Um, in terms of, I think in terms of avoiding, not really, as I said, some filters tend to be a little bit more irritating. So speaking from personal experience, I know when my acne, um, so I had acne through a big proportion of my 20s and at the time mineral fil mineral sunscreen suited me a lot better because I found that the chemical filters were um, quite irritating so they would inflame my acne and make it worse so back then I would have stuck to mineral filters but this was before we had access to uh, newer filters as I said things like tinazol SNM which are a lot less irritating so as I said kind of comes down to trial and error and there's general uh, you know, generally mineral filters may be a little bit less irritating, but they're not necessarily suitable for darker skin tones. So it's, it's kind of is a little bit trial and error finding out what works right for that individual, really. Yeah, sure. What about clients then that have um, a condition that, that perhaps irritates their skin, like perhaps active acne or, or eczema or in some way a compromised skin barrier? Are there things to avoid? Are there sort of gentler formulas that you might start to recommend for those clients? Uh, again, again, it kind of varies from person to person. So generally, I think a mineral-based sunscreen may work suitable for somebody with a compromised skin because they're slightly larger molecules that they're not being absorbed uh, into the deeper layers of the skin. They kind of sit on the surface. Um, but even then, you know, if a skin barrier is compromised, even something like a zinc oxide based cream can, can actually irritate and sting a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where maybe hybrids looking at a mineral and non irritating UV filters like tinners or s and is a really good uh, compromise. I think it's kind of like the best of both worlds, really. Excellent. And um, can we talk a little bit about numbers? Um, because I think there's confusion out there about what um, what SPF number people should be wearing. Do you think that client, most clients should really wear an SPF 50 or is 30 fine to recommend for them for daily wear? Um, and what about these kind of super high factor SPFs that we've seen a bit of on the market, like SPF 90 and, and so on? Are they really effective? Are they more effective than SPF 50? Or is there a certain kind of cutoff where that's that's your best formula yeah so in terms of numbers i would always really encourage people to go for the higher factors so spf 50 really and one of the main reasons for this is because we know that most people don't wear enough uh sunscreen so when all sunscreens are tested in a lab so to get that spf rating on the on the front of the bottle whether it's the spf 30 50 whatever it is in order to achieve that rating they have to test uh, the formulation at two milligrams worth of product per square centimetre of skin. Now, that roughly equates to about a, 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 um, 1.2 grams for the average size face or 2.5 grams for face and neck, which is roughly, uh, so a quarter of a teaspoon for the face and a half a teaspoon for the face and neck. Most people do not apply that amount of sunscreen. They're pl applying half or even a quarter of actually what they need. So if we encourage them to go for a higher factor, bearing in mind that they're probably not going to apply enough, then at least then they'll be getting as close to that kind of minimum of SCF 30 than what we'd be looking for. Um, in terms of whether there is benefit of going you know, uh, higher, this is kind of a little bit controversial in the sense that there's people within the industry that don't agree on agree on this. So from an EU regulation perspective, uh, in terms of when it comes to SPF labelling within the EU, I'm not talking about worldwide, but um, there is a, a numbering system. So it's SPF uh, 15, SPF 30, SPF 50 or SPF 50 plus. So FDF, S, SPF 50 plus is like a catch all for anything that rates over 50. In order for a product to achieve that SPF 50 plus, it has to have tested as a minimum of 60. But within the EU guidelines, it actually states that once it goes over SPF 50, um, that there's very minimal difference. 
between there's very marginal difference sorry um, compared to say SPF 50 versus SPF 60 or, or 70. So when we're seeing very high numbers say like SPF 90 I've even seen one that's like a, a, over 100 um, from an EU regulation perspective that they state that it's very marginal as to the level of protection that that's, that's giving. From a co there are some cosmetic scientists though as, as I mentioned earlier uh, like Michelle at Lab Muffin who, you know, if we look at, say, comparing SPF 30 to SPF 60, then actually that's double the length, the, the length of burn time. So the length of burn time is obviously how much time we can spend in the sun without um, our skin burning or without getting that erythema. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, in that scenario, an SPF 60 is twice as good as an SPF 30 because it's allowing that double the amount of, amount of time. There is, of course, the other argument, though, is that if people have, say, an SPF 100 and they're applying that, then it could lead, it could give them a little bit of a false sense of security mm. and then encourage them to spend, you know, longer out in the sun than actually what is really healthy for them, regardless of whether they're protecting the skin or, skin or not. Um, so personally, I think, you know, SPF 50, SPF 50 plus is, is, is what we should really be aiming for. Okay, excellent. So with that in mind then, how often do you recommend to people that they do reapply SPF if they're out in the sun? Um, again, I suppose it's going to depend on if they're fully out in the sun on a, on a summer holiday or whether it's a, a usual kind of day in the office, but how often should people reapply as a, as a rule? Yeah, so it is going to vary based on brand um, and also that that individual's daily activity. So if it's just, you know, out and about, uh, if you go into an office, you're going to sit in an office away from a window, then actually you probably don't necessarily need to be worrying about reapply reapplying. If you're out and about and going to be on the beach all day, then again, it really depends on the brand that you're using. Um, but roughly the general rule of thumb is kind of every two to three hours because that allows for product to be you know sweat off wiped off with a towel um you know different different reasons why that spf may and as i said some filters uh, some filters are not very photo stable uh whereas others are are really photo stable so like you know zinc oxide for example um uh, some of the tin absorbs, they're really, they are really photostable. So the only way that they're going to break down is by physically brushing off the skin. Whereas things like an oxybenzone may not, it is not very photostable. It has to be stabilized with something else. So again, it does vary, but the general rule of thumb is two to three hours unless otherwise told by the brand, I think. Okay, fabulous, thank you. We have had a question pop up over on Facebook, which was, what does the number mean? So I think this is relating to SPF, um, because I think that's that's a fair question. There's quite a lot of um, uncertainty or misunderstanding about if you're getting, say, an SPF 30, you know, clients might sometimes think, well, that's 30 times longer than usual until I, until I burn, or is it 30 minutes and, and that I can wear it? Or, you know, how... What's the advice that you give to clients, I suppose, on what these numbers actually mean and how to interpret them? Yeah. So first, firstly, uh, really important to understand the SPF rating only relies to the UVB protection. It has no meaning whatsoever when it comes to UVA. Um, although with, within EU, EU sunscreens, if a sunscreen is going to have, uh, um, say, for example, uh, UV. Uh, SPF 30. So that's telling us that it gives us 30 times our UVB protection. So, for example, my maths is terrible. So I'm just going to argue and, and, and say that my burn time is two minutes, right? I can be in the sun for two minutes unprotected before I burn. So if I wear an SPF 30, that gives me 30 times longer. So it, it would give me a full hour before I would burn. Yeah. So you time, it, it all comes down to your nap. And my burn time would be slightly different to your burn time. And it certainly would be, you know, different to um, somebody with a black skin who already has a natural uh, SPF th of about 13. So that would be 30 times their burn time. So if, it, if they could spend an hour in the sun or 30, 30 minutes in the sun before burning, then it's going to be 30 times that 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, but as, I, as I said, the SPF rating only really um, 
determines the UVB protection. UVA protection is categorized by, some, by, by different ratings. So this may include things like the boot five-star rating, for example, or sometimes you'll see a PA followed by lots of plus signs. That's a UVA rating. So that will tell you as to what the level of UVA protection. Um, but from an EU perspective, there is now, and again, this is a relatively new change. Um, I think it's only really been in the last kind of 10 years. But if something has an SPF of 30, then it has to have a minimum of um, uh, a PA rating of, of, of 10, or UVA protection of, of 10, uh, because it's a third of the UVB protection. Absolutely, thank you. Now, it's really interesting. And I think, again, it's, um, it's sometimes difficult to explain uh, the intricacies of, to clients because it's not as simple as, well, it means you can spend this long. It's knowing your own burn time and, and, and that sort of thing, which I think is the, the thing yeah. to explain. Um, we've had another question pop up here in Zoom. We're getting lots of questions through now, which is great. Keep them coming. Anyone else who has any questions, let us know. Um, but the first one we've had over in Zoom is, can you share a bit more insight on options advisable for people living in the African region with a warm climate? Um, skin type three and above, because people in my region are barely used to using any SPF. Um, so yeah, are there any kind of particular recommendations for people who, who yeah, perhaps aren't used to wearing SPF and, uh, and know that they need to do so? But are in that kind of really hot climate? Um, I, I, I think, again, going back to what I said earlier, it really depends on that individual um, kind of skin type and skin colour. So whether certain filters might work well with that in, individual. Um, yeah, it's kind of di difficult to answer when I, I, I don't know the climate and I also don't know the brand that's available in that area, but yeah. Sure, yeah. So it's about, again, knowing your, your burn time and knowing what kind of ingredients suit your skin. Yeah, I think it's a bit interesting. Think, well. Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> we seem to have lots of uh, international people joining us, actually. We've had lots of comments in the chat saying hi from Bahrain, um, hi from Africa. Mm -hmm. So I think there's lots of, uh, yeah, lots of variations of people watching and asking questions, which is fab. Um, another question we've had is, what age can you start using SPF? I mean, presumably this is right from, right from young babies, isn't it, really? There's no sort of dangers or anything associated with with SPFs on very young children. Yeah, no, and you can you can get sunscreens that are actually formulated specifically for babies. So, you know, considering the sun is the, the biggest uh, kind of damaging factor to the skin, I think the earlier the better and really encouraging, not just sunscreen usage as well. Sunsc obviously sunscreen is really important, but I think, um, and again, particularly maybe in the UK, I can't necessarily speak for other, other countries, but particularly in the UK, I don't think we have a, a healthy association with the sun. So when we're, you know, we go on holiday and people still have that kind of beach culture where they, you know, they want to kind of get a tan or they'll spend a lot of time in the, in the sun. So, but sunscreen is just one part of sun or, or sun safety. We've also got to be sun, you know, uh, sun cautious like respectful of the sun so encouraging just like shade breaks and UPF clothing as well so uh, you can get some um, some clothing that actually offers protection um, from from UV as well so it's kind of taking everything into consideration but yeah the younger the better yeah absolutely and actually interesting are there any ways that the skin changes with age in, in the amount of, of SPF, you know, the amount of protection it needs or, um, you know, skin gets older and possibly drier. Are there any kind of ways you would advise clients differently, particularly clients sort of post 70 or, or so? Is that going to be a different sort of approach or much the same? Much the same, really. As I said, I really always encourage people to kind of go for, for, the, for the higher SPFs. But interestingly, one of the things that obviously as we age, we lose melanocytes. So our melan we, are we have less melanocytes, those cells that are creating pigment as we, get a, uh, as we get older. So the older that we get, the more protection that we need anyway. But I think if, if we already have a good sun habit to begin with, you know, UPF clothing, being sun cautious, as well as using a high SPF, uh, then that's going to see us through to old age anyway. Uh, thank you. And um, another question that's popped up, which is quite an interesting one, is about um, marine safe scut sun care. Because I think there's been lots of uh, formulations, particularly recently, lots of launches in marine safe yeah. SPFs. Are these as effective as traditional formulas? Are there any pros and cons? Are there any downsides? Or should we all be switching to these? 
from a performance perspective in terms of protecting the skin, they'll be, you know, just as adequate as, as any other. The idea of a, a reef safe formulation though, and again, and again, this is something that if you follow people like Lab Muffin from Beauty Science or if you follow other cosmetic scientists, the, it's, it's, not, it's not the sunscreens that are actually damaging the reef. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that. Um, Actually, a lot of the reef, um, the barrier reef scientists are getting quite frustrated because of sunscreen being blamed. And actually, there's lots of other things going on, in particular global warming and other environmental kind of pollutants kind of kind of going on. And it's actually that that's causing more damage to the reef than, than the sunscreen. So, again, I, you know, I th and again, one of the brands I, I personally use, a, 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 um, I think the first one to get this reef safe kind of certification, which, you know, is, is, is fine, but um, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on whether a sunscreen is technically reef safe or not, because the science is just not there. Um, and actually, if you speak to a cosmetic, follow a cosmetic scientist and look into the research, they'll argue that actually it's, there are other things going on in, in terms of environmental damage and uh, global warming that's more damaging to the reef. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and another thing I wanted to ask about actually, when we're talking about things that I suppose are um, have been in the press a lot about SPF or, or on, on trend in formulations, um, what about SPFs that protect against blue light? What are there particular filters or ingredients to look out for in these? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on on these SPFs? So, in terms of blue light, it depends on um, where we're worried about the blue light coming from. So. Another big thing, again, it's become a bit big thing within marketing for sunscreen about protecting from blue light, from screens, from phone screens, from computer screens. And again, the science is just not there. The evidence is not there to suggest that actually it's damaging and, um, or there's enough blue light coming from the phones for us to be concerned about. Now, we are exposed to ultraviolet, so it's the ultraviolet, the blue light from the uh, from the visible light scale. It's the ultraviolet, um, the um, violet blue that's actually more damaging. And now we're exposed to that on a daily basis from the sun. We get more high energy visible light from daylight than we do from our screens. So I think it's a good idea to be protecting the skin from from blue light, um, but it may not be as detrimental to all skins in the, sa in the same way. So those people that are more uh, at risk of damage from blue light would be your darker skin tones because they um, are more likely to get hyperpigmentation from the blue light. But again, I would be more concerned about daylight rather than from a, from a screen. But then in terms of filters to look out for, so these would be our um, like iron oxides. So if you're using if you're concerned about blue light and you want to incorporate a, um, a sunscreen that has blue light protection, then maybe look at getting a tinted sunscreen because it's the iron oxides that will be giving the tint. Excellent, makes sense, thank you. And um, another question we've had pop up here in Zoom is what would you say the main differences between EU, UK and USA sunscreens? So are there wide variations, do you know, in the formulations and that are approved for different territories? Yeah, so within um, the US, there's actually they haven't got as many approved filters as what we have within the uh, within the EU. Um, we've actually got a much broader spectrum of, of of UV filters. We've actually got access to some of the more newer generation filters that I mentioned earlier, the Tinazol for S and N, uh, where they're they're not approved within within the um, uh, US. I don't know the full reasons behind this, but I believe a big part of it is because it's regulated by the FDA and in America, they treat uh, UV filters as a drug. So it's regulated as a drug, whereas in the EU, it's regulated as a cosmetic. So there's a big difference. Excellent, thank you. And um, another question, we've got lots popping up. We've, we haven't got time for too many more, but I'll just ask this last one if that's okay. Somebody is asking about um, synthesis of vitamin D, which I think is an interesting one. So. To what extent does SPF block um, your skin from absorbing vitamin D? And is that a concern? Should you take that into account or should clients take that into account? Yeah, I guess it depends on how much um, skin is actually exposed. So majority of clients will only really be protecting their kind of face and, and neck, really. 
uh, maybe arms during the summer if they're, if they're out and about. In terms of vitamin D synthesis, though, we actually don't need to be exposing, you know, very big parts of our of our skin to actually get vitamin D. Um, but then the other aspect is, as, as well is we actually don't get that much sun during, uh, particularly within the UK, I'm speaking at now, obviously, we don't actually get that much UV, uh, UVB all year round to get enough vitamin D from the sun anyway. So I think when if we're looking at the, the skin damage versus um, how much vitamin D that we'd be getting naturally from the sun, I would just be encouraging people to supplement anyway. Yeah, excellent. And it's, it's important, I think, to not take that into account too much to the extent that you're not wearing SPF when you need to, because I think, again, as you say, that's the most important thing, the daily use. Yeah, the daily use. yeah exactly. There's, if, you, if you weigh up the pros and cons, if it was not possible for us to get vitamin D through any other source other than the sun, of course, I would be I would be more encouraging people to, you know, maybe spend a little bit of time in the sun unprotected. But we only need like, well, again, depending on skin type, but for somebody of, of our skin tone, we only need 10, 15 minutes of, of UV exposure to get adequate vitamin D uh, production. Um, so, yeah, but I think when you weigh, weigh the pros and cons, the skin damage, it, it's, why would you do it? we have got access to supplements so why would we just not supplement excellent well yeah that probably is all we have time for andy thank you so much it's been a really popular session we've had lots of uh, lots of chat and uh, and questions here in zoom and on facebook so thank you so much for your time i know it's a, it's a busy time at the moment for particularly for people that specialize in in the facial side of the business which is back up and running so thanks a lot for for giving up some time and, and joining us today and thanks everyone else for joining us. And um, yeah, we've got more webinars coming up this week. So have a look over on professionalbeauty.co.uk forward slash webinars for the rest of the lineup. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.